Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I made it out of Boston to join you. I'm very happy to be here where there's some sunshine. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the role of emotions, not just in packaging, but across uh, brick and mortar and e-commerce a little bit. And the idea here is to, to stimulate some ideas. Um, but what you probably didn't uh, realize you were getting into was uh, a little lecture on neuroscience. So I like to start with the human brain. 100 billion neurons, each one making between 10 and 20,000 connections. It's thought to be the most complex entity in the known universe. And what's really cool is you all have one. And there's very few uh, guarantees I make in life, but I guarantee that the brain you walked in with today is not the brain you're going to go home with. And the reason is, if, if you're relatively awake, uh, you will be hopefully learning and taking in new information, and your emotion center is going to be tagging that for relevance. And then it's going to get stored in long-term memory, and then hopefully sometime down the road, you'll be able to retrieve that and change your behavior. And that simple model that I, and those steps I just laid out for you is essentially how information processing works in the brain. And I'm going to break it down for you uh, very quickly and try to make this really simple by showing you my hand puppet of the brain. OK, you ready? So this is the top, this is the bottom, front, back. My forearm is the spinal cord. So information comes into our brain through our five senses. And the first stop it makes is my palm here, which is sometimes referred to as the hindbrain, where very basic metabolic processing occurs. Am I awake? Am I asleep? Did I get enough food? Is my blood pressure enough to keep me alive? The next stop it makes is my thumb, which is sometimes referred to as the midbrain, where the emotions kick in. And like I said before, they tag information for relevance. The third stop, which some information gets to, is represented by my fingers. This is the neocortex. It's what makes us uniquely human and uniquely complex. Now, what's really interesting about this model, this is evolution. So we evolved from this primitive spinal cord, which we share in common with slugs, through this hindbrain, which we share in common some of its features with reptiles, into a more complex structure, these emotion structures that we share in common with mammals. How many people have uh, pets, dogs, and cats? Do they have emotions? You bet they do. Why? Because they have some of these complex structures. But where it gets really interesting is, is in the neocortex. And if you think about this as evolution, the tip of my finger represents the height of evolution. And what does it do in the brain? It curves around, and it touches my thumb. And if you were paying attention, a little learning occurred. What does my thumb represent? The, the midbrain and the emotion centers. So that's kind of interesting, right? So we evolved to get information from our emotions. And keep that in mind as, as we talk, because not all of the information we have from our emotion centers is available to our conscious processing. And so if you've been reading newspapers and magazines and some of the popular books, uh, you've been seeing how this, this idea of a system one or system two or, or a non-conscious and conscious process has evolved, and that a whole lot of what the brain is doing is below our conscious awareness. So part of the promise of Nielsen Consumer Neuroscience is to bring tools and technologies out of healthcare and academia and bring them to bear on our understanding of how consumers receive information through marketing materials, but also how they make decisions in stores. And so one of the things that we're learning as we look at, for example, how communications work, in this case, television advertising, is that there are very specific structures in the brain that, that correlate and, and show activity with highly engaging ads. And we were very excited when we did the study a few years ago and we found areas like the hippocampus, the amygdala, superior temporal gyrus, and lateral prefrontal cortex lighting up when, when people saw really engaging ads compared to not so engaging ads. Now I'm guessing that those structures don't have a lot of meaning for you. But what if I were to tell you areas of the brain associated with memory formation, emotion generation, sensory integration, and reward evaluation are active when an audience is engaged with commercials. That begins to make sense. And while we anticipated some of these findings, one, one finding really surprised us. And it's that really bright spot in the back of the brain. It's the area of the brain called the precuneus. It's an up and coming part of the brain. And it's thought to be related to where our personal identity is and our sense of self and our relevance. So not only do breakthrough communications have to trigger an emotional response, get us to evaluate reward, integrate sight and sound, and lay down a memory trace, they have to be personally relevant. So if you're going to break through the clutter of the modern landscape, you really have to keep emotions in mind. 
So as I was thinking about uh, some of the, the background for this talk, you know, you can't help but look at some of what happened at the end of last year to sort of set the stage. And we heard a little bit uh, from Shireen about how all these different uh, platforms are starting to integrate. And so this just came out uh, recently and we saw that you know, 90% of consumers use brick and mortar retailers when they shopped for the holidays last year. That's a very large percentage, not too surprising. But what's interesting is what they said and the reason why is they cited touching and trying things and the ability to take it home right away as one of the major reasons. And when they trigger the emotion and the reward, they wanted to have it and they wanted to have it right away. But there was a role for digital. And of course, one of the findings here was that 60% uh, reported using mobile phones while they were shopping in stores. And they were doing things like price comparison, reading reviews uh, as the most common use. And that 50% said they had done some, some research online before they got in. So clearly these platforms are, are interacting. And then what I hope you take away a little bit, and again, just as a thought starter, is this idea that, that the current models are evolving and, and new ways of doing this will will emerge, and so it's not surprising that more and more people are doing click to collect and then come into a store and all of a sudden impulse purchases occur. So one of the things we found over and over again is that there's more impulse purchase that happens in a brick and mortar environment than happens in a, in a retail environment. We can talk about why in a moment. So before I show you some examples of, of how these different environments uh, generate emotion, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about this, this idea of a path to purchase. Because you, you probably are very well aware that, that the idea of the old funnel is, is kind of gone. And what's replaced it in most of the models that I've seen is this idea of a loop. Um, and in order to sort of understand these different loops, you have to have a model for thinking about how consumers travel in what some people have referred to as essentially a roller coaster ride. Right? And the problem with roller coasters, you don't really know when they're going to turn, when they're going to go up, and when they're going to go down. So by having models of consumer behavior, we can begin to anticipate not only what people are gonna do, but why they're doing it. And so one of the frameworks that, that I really like that's very simple at a high level is this idea of a pre-tail, retail, and post-tail environment. So at the pre-tail environment, we're really talking about that connection outside of the commercial environment, whether it's brick and mortar or, or, or e-commerce, where you're connecting to communications. And the idea is to generate an emotional response to lay down memories for future use. And then when you get into that retail environment, whether it's online or offline, you, you wanna re-trigger some of that emotional connection so that people can bring it up. Now again, they don't have to be conscious of this, but you do have to trigger that response. And then finally, I think where, where all the models have an agreement is that something actually happens after purchase. And, and that is sometimes referred to as fulfillment or the experience. And, and here, I think, where, where digital starts to kick in again. So let me show you uh, another version of this, and hopefully you can see this on this screen. But the idea is that instead of a funnel, we have a loop. In the beginning, it starts with some sort of need state activation. Again, whether it's consciously or not, many need states happen on a, on a below conscious level. And what that then triggers is some form of consideration, consciously or not. And then that leads to some evaluation, and then ultimately action, and then purchase. And then, it doesn't end. You have an experience, you bond with that brand, product, or service, and then another loop kicks in if it's a habitual process, and then when you go through that path the second time or the third time, it's shorter, it's faster, and less resources are needed. Remember this model I showed you of the brain? The human brain is one-fifth of the body's weight on average, but it uses one-third of the calories, and one-third of those calories is that connectivity between my fingertip and the emotion centers. What that means is that consciousness takes an awful lot of energy. So it's all, the brain is always looking for ways to do things faster and easier. And that's where habits come in. So think of that outer loop as a consideration loop and the inner loop as a loyalty or habit loop. But the model doesn't end there. And I think what's really important as you think about this path to purchase, that you also figure out and think about what's happening after the experience. So there's another part of the experience loop and that's what some people refer to as advocacy. Merely talking to other people about a brand, product, or service actually reinforces it, even makes it even stronger. And whether that's online or through word of mouth, it actually stimulates habituation and creates this cycle going. Now, each step along this path is an opportunity, an opportunity to make an emotional connection and an opportunity to move people in the direction that you're most interested in. And we call this the advocacy loop. 
So as we think about these different paths to purchase, I want you to be thinking about how you can trigger, trigger emotion along the way. All right, so let's start with the, the brick and mortar environment. So what have we learned? Well, in order to do research in this environment, you have to sort of break things down into parts. Right, that's sort of fundamental to doing research. And one of the ways we've done that is to take the, the, the shopper journey inside the store and break it into these bins. Navigate, search, select, interact, and decide. And you can then code behaviorally each one of these steps. And we use technologies like a biometric belt, which is measuring things like the electricity in their skin or their heart rate. And we can use eye tracking cameras to see where they're looking at the same time. And we can do research on people, which, we, which we've done. And when you look at these different steps, it turns out the two most important are search and then interact. And what we found is that you want people to be very calm when they're searching. You want that search to be easy, and then you want them to have a high emotional response when they interact. So think of it like this. What am I looking for? Ah, oh, that's it. Boom. And what we found is that the higher the emotion, once you interact with the product, the higher the probability of putting that into your basket. Now, this happens to be in a, a large grocery environment. Uh, but what you see here is that the correlation to just being in the aisle was about 0.3. That's about 10% of the variance. But when you look at the non-conscious emotional response as measured by biometrics in those two phases I just described, now the correlation goes up to almost 0.6. That's a third of the variance is happening on an emotional level below people's awareness. Now, when you then look and say, okay, that's within an aisle, what about the whole store experience? And this is uh, something that's actually very hard to measure. We actually recruit people to the parking lot. We give them biometric devices, eye tracking devices, and, and then they take their shopping list, they go into the store, they go all the way through to checkout, and they come back in the parking lot. We've collected the data. We not only have their shopping list, but we also have their receipt. And we know what they bought, what was planned, and what was unplanned. And what's really interesting, and just to give you a little bit of a taste for this, is that emotions are very high walking in the store. People are you know, ready to go, they're on their journey, they're gonna go, and they're gonna buy some stuff. And then over time, it starts to slow down, and, and the reward pathway kicks in. I'll describe that in a second. And then as you're getting to checkout, it starts to kick up again. Well, I'm finally done shopping. I'm going to go home, uh, and, and we exit. And what we found is that that checkout environment can be very tricky, and obviously time of day is a factor. Uh, but, but what's really interesting is that as people go through this journey, the experience in one aisle can absolutely impact another aisle. So if you have a good experience in one, you know, you might be feeling pretty good and go on another one and have a higher probability to, for an impulse purchase or have a higher emotional response than if you have something that is unfortunate like frustration. So we identified two different patterns of, of journeys here. One is optimal, one is suboptimal. The top one, the optimal one, uses uh, emotions and end caps, has rewards and promotions along the way, and has easy navigation. People feel fulfilled, they have a good emotional response, and they end on a high. However, there are certainly times when there's congestion or frustration, it lowers the emotional response, and that actually creates a negative reward cycle and diminishes the experience for people. Obviously, the goal is to have more of the one on the top and less of the one on the bottom. Now, one of the ways that we can help lower frustration is to use technology like eye tracking to see where the visual blind spots are, but also where the, where the hot spots are. And this is just an example, if you haven't seen eye tracking in stores where people can literally wear this either in a virtual environment or a real environment and navigate and we can see what they're looking at and what they're not. And so things like empty shelves can create negative energy and lower people's emotional response. And we've also found that, for example, people in the market for beer, if you put more beer up, they get more emotional. It's not a real surprise, but as you all know, you have to navigate and negotiate that space, which is very prime in those environments. And then the other thing we found is that emotions uh, that we see being triggered in out-of-store communications typically revolve around stories and, and showing relatable characters and often human expression. The human brain has what are called mirror neurons in it. So when we see someone smiling or sad, parts of our brains that generate happiness and sadness actually fire, albeit in a diminished way, but that's how we relate and how one brain understands another one. So showing things like uh, up here on the right, uh, a small child celebrating versus just a product shot actually alters the way people visually consume that information. It makes it easier for them. This is a gaze plot showing the pattern in which they consume it, makes it more efficient, and then generates more of emotional reward. Now, as a, as a 
quick case study, I thought I'd show you uh, one example of, of some work we did a number of years ago with the Campbell Soup Company. And Campbell's had a problem. And their problem was that uh, while people in their home could describe in incredible detail the connection and warmth they had to soup, how it was an antidote to adversity, uh, a, a tool in the cook's uh, toolbox, and of course when people are sick, something great that, that moms could break out. Um, when they got into the store, it was anything but emotionally positive. The, the, the different SKUs had evolved to the point where it was very hard for people to navigate. Um, people were disoriented. And the one that, of course, got everybody's attention was a 10-year-old girl who said to her dad, uh, they don't have chicken noodle soup. And if you talk to anybody at Campbell's, the one thing they guarantee is there's chicken noodle soup on the shelf. And that, that was a problem. So they sent off on a, on a really big effort to understand both consciously and unconsciously how to make this package contemporized and, and more appealing. And through a variety of, of research steps using a, a whole lot of different tools, navigated from this old design to this new design. And I think you know, part of the things we found was how do you bring emotion to a label? Well, one thing was adding steam, which uh, stimulates this, this association to warmth. Enhancing the bowl, making it more contemporary, making the font movement a little bit, change the border, and adding some curved edge suggesting movement all helped contribute to getting more emotion on that label. And when you look at the research results, we found that people didn't spend more time looking at it, but they did have a higher emotional uh, connection with it. Now, of course, in the soup aisle, that's not what you see. What you see are these cards. So we took some of those same findings and we brought them to the art card that sits on front of the label uh, and organized things into benefit clusters, added that steam and contemporary look, and then moved uh, the Campbell's, which was on top, uh, to the bottom. And then finally, we had to organize the shelf. And by creating these benefit clusters and making it easier to navigate by using visual cues, people were able to see different sections like great for kids, great for cooking, classic favorites. And then when you went into the store, you could see how people could look at this and, and learn more as they went. This is a, a young woman. Uh, I don't know if you guys are able to play this. Can you click on that for me? work on that. So she basically says, I found it uh, in, in a very unemotional way. I found it easier to navigate. I found what I was looking for. And it looked cleaner and, and, and made it easier for her to find things, which is exactly what they wanted to do. All right, so switching now from that brick and mortar environment uh, to, to more of an e-commerce environment, you know, how do you navigate this world? So now all of a sudden, you're not talking about a shelf or an end cap. You're really talking about a palette. And it's a palette that can do any number of things. And one of the things that, that we're saying all the time is that what, whatever was working for your brand five, 10 years ago isn't working anymore. Why? Well, because the world has gotten a whole lot more complicated, right? The bar is higher than ever. There are more distractions, more screens, more ways to proliferate things. When we look uh, at people's media consumption, particularly the younger generations, uh, we see that people are constantly grabbing other devices when they get bored. So whether that's watching TV and grabbing a second screen or standing in line grabbing that, that mobile phone, the younger generations have grown up in an environment where screens are a mood regulator. Young generation does not have to suffer boredom because they've never had to. You know, I grew up in a world where uh, a television was an entertainment device, a computer was a productivity device, and a smartphone or a phone was a communication device. Now they're all screens, and they all do all three of them. And that changes the game and makes the bar higher than ever. We also have data suggesting that attention spans are actually shrinking. And there's some data suggesting that the higher and more smartphone use there is, the shorter people's memories are. So imagine a world where you're trying to break through where people's attention spans and memories are actually shorter. It's got to be more difficult. And this is why understanding emotions is really, really important. So shopping online is more convenient, but it is also less emotional. You're sitting there in front of a screen. Uh, you're doing what's called top-down processing. You're thinking about what you're looking for. You're reading reviews. It doesn't have quite the uh, emotional energy as walking through a store, which I think accounts for that proportion we saw this year and continue to see. While more and more dollars are shifting online, there is something emotional about walking through a store and touching different products. And the other challenge online is there is an endless way you can display things. Your constraint is now however many pixels and however big your screen is. This is just a snapshot of, of literally some, some research we did with one of the phone manufacturers 
where they were trying to help users configure a new phone. And there are endless number of choices on a new phone, and therefore there are endless number of screens. So literally walking through different versions of this to try to find the right combination that balanced the ability to give people a choice without overwhelming them and frustrating them. And as we see over and over again through the different e-commerce solutions, um, different paths of navigation can add or enhance or take away from how people think about that environment. So one of the studies we did uh, a couple years ago with Intuit and TurboTax was around a finding that we see more and more, um, whether it's online or offline, is reducing frustration means knowing when to add help. How do you know in an online environment when someone's frustrated? You can't see them, you can't talk to them. All you know is that they clicked away or they put something in the checkout basket and they disappeared. And one of the things we found is that you can use these techniques to measure people's responses and see when frustration gets too high, which tends to correlate with people abandoning the ship. And rarely do we make recommendations to make any screens more cluttered. In this case, people were falling off before they finished their taxes uh, because they weren't sure what was going on and they needed help. And what we found over and over again is as people journey, whether it's in a brick and mortar store, but easier to do in an online environment, is knowing when to intervene and say, hey, do you want someone to talk to? Or hey, is there, is there someone else we can bring in here or a promotion we can offer you really helps convert. Now, as I said before, the, these two worlds are, are coming together. And we've done a number of studies where we actually had people bring phones into stores and see how that impacts uh, their shopping. And when you look uh, even a, a couple years ago, how often people are using phones in store, it's not all the time, but it is increasing and that won't surprise you. But one of the things we found that was very interesting is that merely having a smartphone as you're shopping actually reduced frustration 40% during search. So people just knowing that they have this tool actually made them feel more comfortable, which is sort of a counterintuitive finding. The other thing we found is that people really liked smart lists. It helped them navigate and made them feel like they were doing something. And again, just having something to click on helps them regulate their emotions. The challenge, of course, is which one do you use? How do you promote it? How do you get individuals to use different apps? Um, and on average, people tend to have two at the most of store apps, um, even though they go to endless number of stores. And then, of course, as I'm sure will come up over the next three days, we now have Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram getting into the game. And that's, uh, once again, going to challenge all the different models. So I'll end with uh, two little case studies here um, of, of doing it differently. So this is a, a company called Bauer uh, that has turned the model slightly uh, upside down. And what they're doing is saying, look, come to our store, in this case a sporting goods store, and try anything you like in a variety of different environments. And then you can buy things online, which would then get shipped to you. And what I like about this is it's doing exactly what people say they want, which they want to be able to experience, they want to be able to touch, they want to be able to use, and they want that certainty. Because remember, people are risk averse. They want the certainty that what they're actually looking at and feeling is what they're going to get in that package, something that online can't offer. Uh, and then finally, another model here. Do we think the video is going to work? Um, I want to show you uh, another store that's doing it slightly differently. The shopping season is upon us, and for many, that means using your phone, your tablet, or your computer to shop. And while brick-and-mortar stores are struggling for foot traffic, one retailer has a strategy it hopes will change that story. The store is called Story, and it's reinventing retail by reinventing itself every three to eight weeks. Lots of retailers will change their storefronts or their window displays, but here you actually have the, the base of the store constantly changing. It takes the point of view of a magazine using the merchandise to tell its stories. Today I, it's set up like a home, and so you, you come in and there's like a foyer, and you settle in just like you would coming to somebody's house. It's amazing. It's a, an experience uh, as opposed to just finding something to buy. With everything that's going on with online, we have to create exciting environments for people to get out of their homes and come shopping. Every time you come back, you might be seeing like all new stuff that you haven't seen before. It really becomes a platform of discovery to learn about new brands, and it's an amazing opportunity for small businesses like mine to be able to reach new audiences. So I think the operative word there is experience. How do you create an experience for shoppers so that they can trigger an emotional response and get that reward pathway to fire so that they want to come back and, and do it again.
So in summary, in conclusion, we talked a little bit about the brain, how there are non-conscious and conscious pathways that we have to consider an emotional response, that emotions direct our attention to things that are relevant so that we can store it for later use. We then saw how the path to perch is evolving and no longer is a straight funnel, but made of multiple loops, a consideration loop, a habit loop, and an advocacy loop. And then we saw how there's a few ways that you can think about bringing more emotion into both a brick and mortar environment and uh, uh, an e-commerce environment. Um, and then two examples of how people are changing uh, the model. Uh, so with that, uh, I will leave you with the fact that things that are relevant, they bring people in, they direct on the content, and create strong emotional journeys, and things that are irre irrelevant tend to create boredom, uh, they retreat from the content and respond to their own thoughts. So hopefully you got a little bit out of that, and I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Thank you for your attention. All right, questions? Anybody has questions? Yeah, uh, hang on, we have a mic. Uh, extend the aisle or create a ton of different options for guests as they're coming into their store. So they're using digital platforms to do comp shopping, say there's a ton of assortment online. Is it more important to provide more opportunity or to provide that emotional engagement? That's a great question. Um, I think both. Well, first of all, the, the, the challenge with more is you get very quickly what's called the paradox of choice. Right? There's going to be a line where people just get overwhelmed and tune out. And so, you know, using research and some understanding of what people want uh, is kind of key. And you could do that outside the store. I think in terms of generating emotional response, it, it, it's part of the choice, right? So people want to feel like they were given options because we love options, but not so many that they go over overwhelmed. But if I had my choice, emotions are going to trump choice every time. Cool. Any more? Any more questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, how do you how do you account for sort of this subconscious in consumers' minds uh, to figure out sort of their path to purchase, like the things that they don't realize that they saw while making that decision, but then are still important, especially coming back to this whole attribution question? Yeah, so, so it's really hard. I mean, I just walked you through a few examples. Um, what we're doing is combining both measures of non-conscious processing, whether that's heart rate fluctuations or electrical activity in the skin or where people are looking, and then we're also asking people's questions. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that they line up sometimes. But what's most interesting is when they don't, right? And so very commonly, people say things like, oh, I didn't look at that at all. And you're like, well, here you are staring at that sign. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I looked a little bit. Well, maybe I am interested. And it, and it gives you an opportunity to probe. And I think where these tools are most interesting is when they can sort of talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And you can ask questions on a, on a deeper level that you wouldn't even know to ask because if you're relying on what people say, they're not very good reporters of, what they just experienced. So people lie, right? So people lie all the time. I, you know, I people don't, are liars. I don't think people lie. I think they don't have access to the information they need in order to answer the kinds of questions you have. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, oh, we have one more question. One more question. Sorry, just give it, like, nobody else can hold it over here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You talk about emotions being extremely important to driving the path to purchase. So when you talk about the digital landscape, how do you think content and delivering your message within contextually you know, relevant area is for consumers? Su super important. Uh, so Wednesday, I'm going to be uh, in New York, hopefully the snow won't melt it, um, and giving a talk uh, as part of the Advertising Research Foundation is doing a big search across multiple platforms, right? What's the right message? How long should an advertisement be? What's the right context? And one of the things that we see over and over again is context matters. The brain is a context machine. Um, and so how do I understand if I say the word tide, whether I'm talking about the soap or the beautiful ocean outside our window? Uh, you don't, unless you have some context. Now in here, many of you may have associated to the soap uh, because we are talking about shoppers. Or you said, well, I'm at Laguna Beach. Without a little bit more information, uh, you, you don't know. And so again, over and over again, particularly for display advertising, which tends to not get very much visual attention, um, having that extra bit of context really helps people generate more navigation and more emotional connection when they land where they want to go. Great. Great. That's all the time we have, so thank you so much. Okay. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. We're